Podcast blog, uh, streaming show available on YouTube, Facebook, Mega, and hopefully uh, internet radio station soon. We'll see if that actually happens. And today I have a special guest, as kind of promised. And I am not recording this, so I should actually make sure I'm putting this. Hooray technology! Hooray technology! Facebook knows that this conversation is coming through. <laughs> we'll continue there. But so anyway, I have uh, here. Devin Archman, currently live in Montreal. Montreal. Say hi, Devin. Hello. Hopefully hi. the internet can hi. hear you. So I met Devin when he was still a computer science student at the University of Regina. He's since done many other things, as we kind of all have. So I, I just want to give you a, a chance to de describe quickly the path from computer science to where you kind of currently are. To give kind of a context of the, I guess, what you're going to say. How about that? Sure, sure. So I started on computer science and um, fell off the bandwagon or went astray or something, as we might call it. Ended up in classical music performance. And, and, I'll, and ju I'll just pause here in that I've heard you play a couple of times and you're pretty damn good. So <laughs> you, you've, you've got uh, some serious musical talent there. Uh, I haven't heard it enough to know kind of what you've been doing more recently, but today is probably right. going to be more along the other things you're interested in. But there is yeah, a musical yeah, yeah. side. Yeah. <laughs> well, my entire family is fairly kind of heavily into music. I mean, I start, started studying violin when I was four. So computer science was kind of like the move more to technology. And then um, I kind of went back to the music thing for a while. I mean, I've always been heavily interested in music, but more kind of, kind of the intersection of technology and, and music and kind of electronic instruments and kind of programming sound. So yeah, I moved into, into classical performance for a couple of years. And then I wandered into English literature and finished, ended up finishing my degree that way. So, you know, so, so, three so major. Just, just a pause there. So how exactly does one wander into English literature? Like, I, I know well, there's a lot of paths there, but... Well, I knew I had quite a number of people in my orbit who were interested in that. Obviously, I've always been kind of interested in, in narrative and, uh, and books. And I was working in the music performance field, and I found well, I have no sight, which I suppose would have become yet, yet apparent, um, aside from the fact that I'm not, not probably looking at the video feed. But I found that in the music performance area, I was fighting more with accessibility issues to do with scores, to do with some of the theory courses, just um, getting material kind of transcribed or completing things, more than I was actually doing the tasks that I was in that program to be doing. Right. And I have never been particularly interested in being accessibility for or I, I'd rather work 
in areas that I can do the work that is to be done in the field rather than make the field kind of an amenable to that work being done. Right. And so I just bailed. I bailed and I went, well, I mean, I'm also interested in, uh, in, in, in text, in kind of literary theory. And so I, I jumped ship and moved the degree into that field. Now, when you switch majors three times, the well, university loves you because, of course, they get plenty more of your money. Right. Um, which is also a great thing. No, I mean, I never stopped, you know, working on programming. I just decided that I didn't want to do the more academic side of kind of the, the computer science and the theory. Um, right. I, you know, kind of kept up learning new languages. And, I mean, we've all worked, obviously, you know, in the, in the pits of web development here and there. I'm sure everyone probably was even watching this thing <laughs> has been snared, has been snared in that awful house. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, HTML is great. Um, so is JavaScript. Wonderful, very, very safe, excellent, useful language. No way to, you know, destroy <laughs> anything with JavaScript. There's no nightmares um, there at all. No, yeah, none at no all. no nightmares at all. But I kind of, you know, wandered in and out of academia for quite a number of years. Like I said, took some time off, went back to music, took some more time off, went back, did uh, English. And then when I finished that degree, I decided I wanted to pursue a master's in, in literature and have come out to Montreal. I mean, for various other reasons, obviously, I wanted to come out here. Um, it's a great city. There's a lot of music. There's all sorts of interesting things happening. We actually have transport, which is nice when you can't drive yourself. Yeah, um, yeah we, we were talking a little bit about that before we kind of started. So yeah. uh, from, from your perspective, the differences between Montreal and living in Saskatchewan, like what, where, how, how would you kind of describe the, the kind of main differences and kind of go from there? Um, in which area? Uh, well, well, start with kind of generally. Like for, for someone who's been kind of lived their entire life in Saskatchewan and born and raised and hasn't gone outside yeah, of the province yeah. except for maybe like to go to Vegas or something like that, what is the culture shock that you're going through or at least went through when you first moved to Montreal and kind of where, where are the, the big differences that you would point out? Well, I mean, I think one of the biggest differences is that, and I think this is probably true of most large cities, just um, many more things are much more planned, like social engagements. Like people, because if you are going across the city to meet up with people, or just because people have vastly more numbers of things that they have available for them to do, mm-hmm. if you want to kind of have social engagements of people that aren't your very close kind of circle of friends, there often needs to be a lot more planning involved, and people are kind of much more regimented about setting up things ahead of time as opposed to just kind of like throwing somebody up, okay, let's get together in an hour. Yeah, um, and, and I kind of noticed that when I was in Toronto visiting my cousins too, that there was, yeah. like you said, so much more to do that you have to kind of plan ahead. And the person who drops in out of nowhere and doesn't know this drives everyone around them crazy because it's like, no, yeah, we can't yeah. just do this at a dime, Jeff. You have to... Like, think about this. And, yeah. Well, and it's also that it just becomes cultural. People don't expect it. Even yeah. If it's a, even if it's a situation where you could just drop in or you could get this planned in half an hour, it's just that it's not done. Then. It's right. Not, I mean, you know, and so there's definitely that's a culture shock. I mean, I, one of my neighbors is one of my oldest friends. We've um, known each other for like 20 years. And still we'll like, be like, oh, here, let's get together for a drink tomorrow. And we live, you know, I live on the floor below her. It just becomes kind of a natural state and it carries through into most kind of situations. So that's a bit of a culture shock. I mean, Saskatchewan is definitely much very haphazard, like things can happen very much on the fly because right. it's cultural, it's, it's possible for those kind of things to happen. When the most you might have to do is drive 10 minutes across the city or three miles down the, the road to the next farm, like whether it's in the large, quote unquote, larger cities of the province or even among more kind of rural areas, these things are just more feasible. Right. So and I, mean, I think, yeah, it becomes more culture, part of the culture, like just to talk about people. Right. You wouldn't do that here. And I think in, in, in the same in, in many large cities. So but of course, uh, go ahead. Well, I was, I was just going to say, so, so there's the kind of time and planning aspect that was kind of like a culture shock. What, what else was the... Yeah kind of a, a, a difference that kind of what wasn't maybe explained to you as someone who was moving there, what else would people kind of expect to, to see different in between Montreal? You know, it's hard to say. I found it a fairly seamless transition. 
Okay. Which I was surprised at how easy it was. I thought there would be much more just logistics or kind of cultural differences. I mean, obviously French. Yeah, there's, there's I that. went in studying English literature and know that due to the wonderful, excellent education that we receive in our second, you know, in our second language as a country, you know, the beautiful, thorough understanding <laughs> that we are given um, at the elementary and high school levels, I came in knowing three or four French words. Yeah. And that, it's not a problem. People will speak to you in that language, but it definitely limits the kind of events that you can go to, the people you will hang around with. There are just things that are more difficult or are just not accessible to you if you don't know what language is. Hmm. Never mind the other proliferation of languages that are spoken in the city. I mean, it's very multi multicultural, and I mean, as in any large city, the multicultural places. But even just to know the two basic languages gives you, would give you such... Give you that kind of common language, language the lingua yeah. franca to get yeah, around with. exactly. And there are things that you just don't go to because they're French events, and you just won't get anything out of them. Right. Um, if you only speak English. And I'm sure it's the same way that, you know, there's lots of stuff that's anglophone, that people who only speak French would be remiss or not able to attend as well. You just, it's a city of multiple languages, and that's something. Coming from Saskatchewan, which is very kind of mono, monolingual. Monoculture mono almost. Yeah, yeah, monolingual. <laughs> um, if I can kind of create a term here, that's just something you have to get used to and something you have to factor into kind of the sociality of the place. Now, of course, studying at Concordia at an English university, living, I lived in kind of McGill Get Meadow kind of area, which is a very student area. And McGill, again, is another large you know, English university. There's a lot of English, you know. It's, and I'm living in an area that's fairly dual. Like, there are areas of the city that are much more French. There are areas that are much more fully English. I'm in an area that's definitely kind of a, a mix of the two. Okay. And so, I mean, that's definitely, I knew that was going to be the case, but it's definitely something you have to kind of get around and, but one of the biggest things is just the pure number of things that there are to do. Like in Saskatchewan, of course, what you find if you're interested in kind of music or kind of any kind of artistic events, when one comes around, you kind of grab on. Yeah, you kind of have to go to it when you, you have kind a of chance. Have because that chance may not come around very often. Right. What you will find out very quickly in the large city, of course, is that that happens six times a day. <laughs> like two in the morning on a Sunday night, you have an excellent DJ thing to go to. Two in the afternoon on Thursday, there'll be a jazz set happening somewhere in a park. Like there's stuff all the time, and that tendency to like when you see something great, to, like expand all efforts to get to it. And then, um, and especially if you're like a master's student and should be working on your thesis. Exactly. That's <laughs> it's like very, that's a week later, you haven't quickly. done. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to realize that like can and shouldn't feel the need to attend all of these things because there are a hundred times as many of them as you could possibly go to. And you need to be selective in a way, like it's you, you have a different kind of relationship with with the events and what you feel that you must go to and see because there are just it could be overwhelming if you start, you know, and that's just something you have to fight against. I mean it's easy if you're a student because you don't hear it on you're broken, you know, you're spending all your money, you're giving it all to the university, so it's all good. But yeah. you know what, even that, there are like, there's a hundred free cops in the day, or films in the park, or just, there is stuff all the time, and that's something coming from a place of limited events, that you have to kind of change and upend that attitude. So that's definitely a, a difference, you know. And, and then, as I was mentioning, and we kind of touched on a little bit, the transportation thing. So, well, yeah. what what is the difference between getting around in Montreal versus kind of getting around in Regina or somewhere else in Saskatchewan? How, how do you describe well, it? The, the major difference is that we have a fully funded transportation system out here. I left Saskatchewan one year after the Saskatchewan party government, in their wisdom, defunded and shut down our uh, kind of public intercity transit system. So the SDC, um, in other words. Yes, the SDC. And of course, you know, they're, 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 they, they argued that it was not efficient, that it was run. And of course, that was like, well, if you defund something and you sabotage it long enough, yeah. <laughs> um, eventually, it will be in a position where you can credibly say, this thing is not doing well, it's losing money, and we need to shut it down. Plus, so plus on top of that, like, there are certain aspects of things that a government does where yeah. you can't expect it to ever be profitable. Like, there, there are going but to the be making, you know, making buildings wheelchair accessible. The government may make that have to happen, 
but the profit from that may not ever really happen, right? Like it, it's that one governments building. Are not, yeah. 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 You know, governments don't have shareholders. Exactly. Government is not a service that is meant, and it should not be generating a profit. Like ideal, you know, if a, if a sector of government generates profit, which that should be plowed into making some other service more well funded and run, or if everything is ticking along fine, then you have an opportunity in the future to reduce the tax burden on your citizens. Right, exactly. Um, absolutely. In, in Saskatchewan, I mean, like I said, I left one year after they basically made it impossible if you can or choose not to drive to get around our problems. So, so uh, out of curiosity, can. when so mm -hmm. since it was before you left, was that a factor yeah. in you leaving? It wasn't because I planned on moving away from Saskatchewan. I've been there long enough, hmm. and I d intended on doing a master's somewhere other than a university in Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. But if it, if I hadn't had those intentions, it definitely would have pushed me there anyway. Like even if I hadn't been going to do a master's out here. You can't stay in a place that you can't get around. Right. Um, and particularly for something you can't see, well, you're not just going to go buy a car. I mean, there are all sorts of people who can't get around, you know, whether they choose not to drive because either they're elderly, they don't necessarily have the monetary capital to own a vehicle, or they just physically can't drive. Like, they have a sight impairment like me, they have, they have absolutely, absolutely, there's a thousand reasons yeah. that one would may not choose not to or may not have the opportunity to own their own vehicle. And if that means then that you literally have no way to get not only kind of around our problems, but really to get out of into any other problems too. Like I had a roommate who oftentimes would need to go back to Lethbridge to take care of her elderly father. She, would, she lived in Regina and would go back for a week at a time, you know, once every month or two. And she didn't own a vehicle. And and this point. this would have been possible with uh, yep. the SDC would have probably got her closer, uh, and the Greyhound. Well, the SDC would have got her closer, but yeah. the other thing was is that you had the Greyhound, right? Because the SDC and the Greyhound kind of like inter, they were intermodal kind of. They, yeah, they supported each other's kind of facilitating each other's coexistence. Hmm. I mean, you you saw that very soon after. The um, STC cut its service, well, Greyhound cut its service as well. Yeah. And now I'm not saying that those things were necessarily linked, but there definitely was a, an interdependency there that when STC was working and running, it made Greyhounds running a lot easier as well. Hmm. And it, like, it would have just been one more nail in the coffin for them to say, well, we have to, use, we, we don't even have proper stops in the province anymore. We don't have, it's not worth it for us to run the service because the infrastructure, they are cutting the infrastructure. And selling it off and, and making. And this is the, and this, the other thing is this, is this is public infrastructure. Right. Like Saskatchewan, at taxpayers' expense, we bought a set of, bus, of, of buses. Wait, which, by the way, retro. one of the STC buses, I, I took a bus out of a bus company called Cast. It's like an upstart Thunder Bay bus service to replace Greyhound's void that they left in the northwest Ontario region. It'll get yeah. you as far as Winnipeg. But I noticed right away that. It's an SDC bus, and they haven't changed right. the Wi-Fi on it. I mean, the Wi-Fi doesn't work because, obviously, whatever yeah. satellite system they were using isn't being paid anymore. But if you try to yeah. connect to it, it still says SDC number whatever, whatever, right? So, yeah. like, yeah. someone got that bus at a decent price. but Well, and the, and the funny thing is they had just upgraded a lot of the fleet in yeah. five years previous. The other thing is they had just, at great expense, retrofitted they had redone the terminal in Regina. Regina yeah, yeah. Which, which for anyone who hasn't it seen well. it, like the old bus terminal in Regina was, it was a little bit of a beat up, sketchy place. Like kind of dark, chairs were kind of in not good of condition. It was kind of not, I mean, that area isn't great anyway, but the, one, the, the station they replaced it with was this kind of beautiful, really wide open spaces, very modern design, and then almost immediately after they finished building it, boom, STC is gone. So yeah, I think it was it was within a year, and I used to use that service quite a bit because I often would travel between Regina and Saskatoon. I had family friends in Saskatoon, and it was a very reasonably priced and handy way to get along among the province. Like out here, we have we have I mean that's the thing we have metros, we have bus transit, we have a lot of light rail. There are just 
so many ways to get around, and it's also a deceptive that people will use kind of the transit systems. And, and they're just, I mean, this is any large city, I think. It's like, well, for one, there isn't the infrastructure capacity for everyone to own a vehicle. And a lot of people out here, and this is interesting, a lot of people out here don't have, don't have licenses. Hmm. They've never felt, and a lot of people were from Montreal. Because, you know, we get a lot of them are fairly transient city. We get a lot of people. Yeah, like who students license. who come and live there for yeah, a while. Or yeah, what was it? Yeah. One, one of my other friends was like, it's the city to this. To, what was it, discover yourself, or like when you're trying to discover yourself, like to go sit in for a couple of years while you kind of waste your, your time there, and oh, I can't remember yeah, yeah. the exact words, but yeah. Because, yeah, there are so many opportunities, there are so many things you can try and explore and figure out what fits you. But so those people who have cars, have, or, or at least have licenses, a lot of people who are from here don't necessarily, for one, um, it costs more to get a license out here. Like the one thing about Saskatchewan, oh, it's weak. Because, of course, the rural background, we instituted driver training into our, our high school system. And people don't realize what an advantage of that is. is because out here, in a lot of places, you have to pay for those courses. Okay. And they're not cheap. And if it's not something that you see the necessarily the immediate facility for, like, you might, maybe you'll, you'll use a car once every couple of years when you rent a U-Haul to move. Right. So if that's the only time you're going to use a car because of our public infrastructure... Yeah, at that level, it's almost like kind of like the guy who owns the truck, right? Yeah. You may as yeah. well get him to do the driving because he's the guy yeah. who owns the truck anyway. So Exactly. So a lot of people here, we have such good infrastructure, people don't see the need to own a vehicle or even have license. And in a lot of cases, it's a liability. Like if you live in some of the kind of older areas of the city, there just aren't the facilities for parking, even, right? Like those small streets, you're going to pay a ton and there just aren't that many spaces huh. in, in two park. So... Yeah, transport here is definitely different. But I mean, and, and you mentioned freedom. that, like, before we started talking, that, like, your particular apartment isn't really all that close to the university, no. but you can get onto the, what was it, the metro, and be, like, at the university yeah, the in yeah. 11 minutes or something? Yeah, like 10 to 11 minutes. And the stop that you get off connects underground through a tunnel to the university kind of building complex. So... If it's the middle of winter, you don't even, like, once you're in a tube station, you don't even have to go outside, which is kind of incredible. So do, would you even have to have a jacket at that point? Well, I'm five blocks away from the metro stop, so you probably want a jacket on your way to and from. Uh -huh. But if you could top that five-block walk... Then that five blocks is not that be, long. <laughs> it's not. It's not. But it's 25, 30 below, and it's, like, 80% humidity. Yeah, I it, guess. You, you probably want some kind of a jacket, but it's certainly not like the big... Just, yeah, you don't need a big... Perfect. For yeah. sure, yeah. No, it's, it's an incredible system, and it's also just the frequency of it. I mean, I was home in June for a friend's wedding, and I was going out on a Friday evening. Well, I missed a bus because, for one, their timetables are... Like the city transit buses, I would say, there are, their timetables are what I would like to use here. Fanciful or optimistic <laughs> is the way I would describe their schedule. Well, you miss a bus at 6 p.m. on Friday evening, and you're waiting 45 minutes for another bus, mm. which you miss a metro in Montreal at, like, 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning, and you're waiting 15 minutes. And because you're psychologically used to them coming every three minutes, 15 minutes, it's ridiculous. <laughs> like, how can I stand here? And then you go home and you go, oh, yeah, this is what... This is normal here. <laughs> like, this is normal, like, 45 minutes. And just the number of routes are just not. I mean, it makes it makes car ownership definitely much more of a necessity. And it's interesting when you were talking to was it Crystal? Um, Crystal was it the previous show or the one before? Yeah, two two shows two? back. Yeah. Yeah, and you made this point about how we were never going to get away from cars in North America in the next five years. And it's funny, you know, when you put the yellow in the video, it's happening. And I'll, so I'll make a point now. Even if we had 100 buses, the problem is, is that our city, especially the cities that were built at the turn of last century, mm -hmm. and more recently, are built for driving. Like, you don't, you have areas where you don't even have bloody sidewalks yeah. beside the roads. Because it's assumed that you will be in a car and you will pull into your drive. We have not made the, the infrastructure for public transit or for walking. And this is why some of these older cities of Montreal in some ways do better because these cities pre-exist the automobile. So they kind of um, had the walking design from day they one. They had the walking design. They, had, they knew the, the benefit of, of setting up metros. Um, now, of course, some of the outer areas certainly you would need to drive to. They're not a panacea. 
But I'm just saying, they, in some ways, they are much more, they have that, a lot of that infrastructure to fall back on that was built pre-automobile. And a lot of, you know, the cities like the East of Regina, like you go to the north end, like you were saying the other day, or the east end of the city, without a car, you can't get to these areas. And that just impacts people's economic mobility. When you can't move, you can't even rent in some areas in the city if you don't own a car, you can't sell the sports on a car. Right. There are lots of jobs, but even if you don't need a car to do the job, you know, I'm a delivery driver, you need a car to get to the job. And if you don't have that, Option well, and especially with wages, like you're not going to Uber to and from your job every day. No, um, especially so, not with like a minimum wage job yeah. or something, right? No, well, exactly. So, so transport is is a big deal, and it's something that I think people in larger cities forget. Like whatever. Well, I, no, I, I think it's, it's one of those things where like. You're, if you live in the same place basically for your entire life, it, it's like the, the water that the fish doesn't see, right? It, 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 yeah. You just expect that everyone in the world deals with your particular kind of system, even though cities are different. Like Toronto is definitely different than like the Saskatchewan model. Thunder Bay is different a little bit than the, the yeah. Saskatchewan. But, I mean, there, there are across North America a lot of similarities, but they're, they're are differences that we can look at and go, okay, we could do things differently in Saskatoon, yeah. and it may take 25 years or 50 years to get to where they are in Holland, for example, but it is doable. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we, and that's the thing is, when you have these small differences, you've, run, you've done a lot of A-B a testing. Yeah. So you can see what works, what doesn't work. Exactly. Of course, you need the perspective of having lived in enough places, because like you said, we don't see the water. You don't see, you know, so... Yeah, transportation is definitely a big, a big thing. And still, it seems like a luxury two years later. It's still not, and it will, of course. There will be a day when I have just fall victim to just seeing it as uh, normal and just expected. And, but it, it's still, at this point, two years later, even still kind of like this privilege. Like, oh, yeah, great. Oh, yeah, I can, I can hop on a train at 1130 at night and go meet somebody downtown for a drink, and it takes 20 minutes. So, and, so we are getting a little bit of comments from the peanut gallery saying you're a little quiet. So I don't know if you can turn okay. yourself up a little bit. But. I can talk a little louder. I have the headset in. That's a, I thought the mic on that would be a little clearer than on the phone. Is that any better? Uh, when you were holding it a little bit closer, that sounded better okay. to me. Okay, so I'll hold it a little closer. Uh, but if anyone is still listening, <laughs> keep throwing those <laughs> yeah. peanuts. We need them. Uh, so... Uh, kind of a, a, enough on the, the transportation side for now. So you are yeah. working on your, your master's thesis. Uh, yeah. And so it, what, what is your thesis about? What, where, is it like totally inaccessible? You're you saying it was a kind of about somebody's work? Yeah, it's about a Canadian science fiction writer based in Toronto. His name is Peter Watt. And very interested in kind of the forms that kind of intelligence can take and the idea of intelligence that aren't necessarily based in the idea of the I as the central self or even necessarily consciousness as being a precludery kind of a concept for intelligence. So, so kind of like, like the, the difference I, between intelligence as a human being would have and kind yeah. of like the intelligence that the devices that kind of surround us might be or slowly get in. some kind of another being might evolve. Like the, I, one of his kind of cool premises that he looks at in a lot of the work is that a lot of intelligence, the, co the consciousness as part of intelligence may not be the most adaptive fit for kind of at least efficient information processing and kind of exploring what kind of ramifications that our version of intelligence may, at least kind of theoretically in the work, may not be the most adaptive of solutions. And just that once what was in play, of course, it, it, it kind of, the, the, the self and the narrative kind of that pattern matching kind of became the dominant, but not necessarily that it was the most efficient and if things might have gone a different way. The idea that what we see as kind of the best adaptive fit for situations, because we see them as the best because they center around us, not that they necessarily were the most efficient or that they were even necessarily destined to be the case. Like I'm still doing a lot of research on kind of models he's using in his work and kind of the linguistic tricks. But yeah, very his, his work is really interesting and he has a background in a PhD in biology, so okay. the nice thing is that there's a lot of kind of a lot of kind of plausible science right. um, in, in the work, which is of course one of the core tenets of the best science fiction is that it's not necessarily uh, and what if is more of a what happens after what if. Like, okay, here's a paper, here's
hear some of these findings um, extrapolate out. Um, right. So more kind of imagine what could be. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been kind of working on that and kind of getting back into that project. In the first couple of years, I was doing coursework. And as I was saying before, it blew on the air. It's like when you're studying kind of medieval literature and Victorian novels, it's hard to also kind of be focused on kind of 21st century science fiction. So the project kind of shunted to the wayside while I was finishing all the coursework. So at this stage, I'm kind of just getting back into pulling all the material that I kind of gathered in the bibliography together, doing the research, kind of writing, getting bits and pieces out of it to yeah. try and put, put a, a piece of text on his work together. And that will kind of happen over the next, I'd like to be done by the end of December of this year, so that will happen over the next four or five months. Okay. So, so it's kind of interesting that you put it in terms, or, or he put it, I guess, in terms of the, the ed adaptation part. Because, like, it, especially in the context where we were kind of talking about before, where, like, the, this public services and how to kind of manage them best, transportation seems like a similar kind of problem to the building of intelligent machines generally. In that, well, yeah. The, there is I mean, this, it's some, well, yeah, well, it, it, it just seems that there is a, we are going to be building these systems. And we're going to be building these systems that know things about us and that can act on that knowledge in an intelligent way. But the haphazard way that we've been doing it is just sort of like, okay, well, whatever Silicon Valley startup or little group of people, it's totally fine for them to have the knowledge of what everyone eats for breakfast in the world, right? Like that's, if they can figure a way to pull that data, then they can, they can have that data, they can kind of use that data. And, and it seems like that kind of model of just like, totally anything goes has led to the the sort of it, it's like that the, there are problems with that and there are problems with the 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 lack of a, a kind of consistent societal level feedback loop where we can control these systems yeah yeah definitely and uh this is kind of the other area that i'm, I'm quite interested in right now is kind of kind of looking at kind of as I'd like to kind of go talk about it in terms of kind of like data ethics. The problem, it seems like in the technology sector, is that there often seems to be people who know a lot about technology. You seem to get a paternalistic attitude towards people who know less about technology. And, and not to say that it comes out of a place of kind of derision or superiority, but I think oftentimes when I think about this, I look at like the way sometimes you would perform tech support. Like, when, when you're fixing somebody who doesn't know very much about their computer, well, do you show them what went wrong with it and what was the chain of events that led to the problem? Or do you spend three minutes to fix it, maybe put some guardrails in place so that they don't ease, as easily break and like, put it in kind of like, like set them up a non-administered account right. in their windows. Switch it over. Don't even necessarily even tell them because you have to explain it all. And because they're never going to know the difference anyway. You, you go into the user account and you go, okay, downgrade this account for investor. They didn't need that in the first place. They didn't even know they had it. They won't know that they don't. And now I won't have to come back next week when I'm here for, for, for Sunday dinner and spend three hours fixing the computer again. And, and if you and do have to out, spend a time fixing it because they've done something to it again, at least they didn't have administrator access, so right. what could they have done, <laughs> right? Exactly. And that can be a very good thing. It comes off in often cases out of a place of, kind of wanting to help people. Right. The problem with that attitude is that it then leads into you making decisions for people, and that becomes problematic when you decide that you, A, either know best, don't feel like explaining it to them, like, even just something as simple as, I'm going to store your password for my website in a cookie in your browser, because I know the next time you come to use it, you're going to have forgotten the password, <laughs> you're going to have to do an email reset, and 90% of people who get to that point will just stop using the website instead of going to the trouble of doing the email reset because they forgot it, or they'll set up a new account and I have more entries in my database, so I'm just going to make this executive decision that I'm going to store it and because it, it makes it easier and better for me. Yeah. And you, you look at these patterns, and these patterns all come out of a place of having group people who know very a lot about the way something works, and people who know very, very little. And, 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 and like, a stark divide between that. 
and, and that actually was kind of what I was trying to get at with the transportation thing too, right? There are transportation engineers who put a lot of work, presumably, and a lot of thinking and a lot of overtime into designing the cities as effectively as they could around the, the automobile at one point. And they did Absolutely. hard work. Yeah. And they they made those decisions for everyone else that are going to last for decades and decades and yeah. are still making those decisions for yeah. decades and decades. But Well, and they made those decisions with the data that they had at hand. Like right. We are, we are looking, it's the 50s, it's the 60s. More and more percentage of people are buying automobiles. This seems to be a sector that's growing. People want the personal autonomy of having a car. We will build the infrastructure to support that and to make that better and easier for people. The problem is, is that you don't realize the lock-in once you've built those things, right? Like once you set this up in this way, it's much harder later to go and change it. And when people don't know, it's like the water for the fish, as you said before. When people don't even realize that there were other ways of building a city, like we didn't have to build an area that literally has one road leading in and out of it with a gate, when there were other options available. When people become disengaged with the infrastructure planning that goes on around them, I mean, it's the same way that when people become disengaged with government in general, right. and voting, and all of these things, you get a group of people, a smaller group of people who know a lot about an area and are making, again, I don't want to kind of attribute malice because it's like I think they're often cases doing the best with the data they have at hand. Unfortunately, well, well, that doesn't matter if you what your intentions were. It's that you. It's the you structure, the right? It's it's the it's structure the of the, si the situation, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, so I I did kind of want to lead into this, but I'll just point out that the Facebook feed died. So I've linked to the new Facebook feed from the old one. Hopefully, the people that were on the old one will see it. Uh, we are still live though. So now, in terms of it making it possible for us to stay engaged, because. It is a technically difficult thing, both in the transportation side and in the, the, the world of technology side, to actually stay engaged. Like, just like with the, the music events in Montreal, right? Like where the, there's a hundred things you can be yeah. engaged with. Where is it best to kind of like focus your, your time and effort on? But one of the tools yeah. we have to do this is, of course, the blog, right? Where someone who knows about or is interested in a specific topic can publish the, the information relevant to that topic, and you can kind of drill down in that way. Now, I, I did want to bring up that you are starting a blog? Or, yes, yeah. So wh what is the blog called? Have you got a website? Oh, kind of what is it about? So kind of go from so, there. So, yeah, so the blog is theband.dev, -E and just because my name is Devin and because Google launched that subdomain a couple of months ago and I thought it was kind of clever too. And because, of course, it's dealing with technology and development. Right. I thought that was an excellent extension to go with. So it's kind of looking at like both kind of like what's coming around the band and play on that, but also that things are kind of right around the band. Like things in tech right now are pretty um, kind of fucked up. And there's a lot of blowback to you with tech and I think there's a lot of disillusionment in, a, in an area that for the longest time was seen as infallible as kind of the next kind of savior of humanity, the environment, law, in the savior of free speech, kind of civil engagement, um, all the upside was seen, and now there seems to be a bit of a kind of a, a hangover or a disillusionment. And we're in a situation where a lot of these things, like you look at like the vast kind of power that Facebook just exerts in the world just due to the scale, or things like that, like things are kind of at a very interesting point of technology. So what I want to focus on mostly is kind of problems of data ethics. And of course, the big three, you know, Apple, Google, Facebook are kind of my main focuses. Most tech, tech I engage with most is So, so not Apple, so much so like the, the Equifax, Experian, that sort of thing. Uh, no, because I see those as old world businesses that are having problems, but those are just changes of scale digital problems. They're not new types of problems. Like the fact that those records are being stored in a digital domain in which they can be broken into and stolen is problematic for sure, but they're not new problems. Like they've been collecting that data for 40 years. Right. And they've been kind of prodding people, manipulating it the same like those aren't newer problems. 
I'm kind of more interested in the the new models that kind of digital systems allow. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly I might comment on the Equifax or something like that. And I think it's very interesting that they are now offering a refund to people, I think, of $125. But I, I did look into that, and they gave you, th I think it was three options. And the first option was the one that people were recommending you take, I take the 125 bucks, even though it's it's probably like saying in addition to that, yes, I agree not to sue you for anything else, and I'll take part in this class action yeah. lawsuit. But they also made it a requirement to get that 125 bucks that you have agreed that you have all either are going to get credit monitoring through them for free, of course, or that you're going to get credit monitoring from another company, maybe for free, maybe maybe not. But there's no way yeah. to get the 125 bucks if you just don't want the credit monitoring. If you don't find the, the idea of the credit system legitimate at, at its core enough to, to vindicate yeah. their existence by allowing them to have like a, a credit monitoring system set up, right? So yeah. it's like, in, it, it's not just that you're agreeing, oh yes, it's, it's, you're paying me 125 bucks plus whatever to the lawyers to, in exchange for violating my privacy, and now we're kind of on equal terms again. It's yeah, like, we are doing that, and I agree that you're a legitimate company, right? <laughs> and so that, yeah, that's and, one, and one bridge too far for like, me. And you're also kind of buying allegiance, thing, as you said, into that system. Yeah. You're legitimizing it. You're, you're further enmeshing yourself in that system. Right. And it's also just the idea that data is transactional. It's also a meshing in the consumer mind, and I think this is what's most interesting about it, the idea that data is transactional and that data has a monetary kind of specific value. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that approach is that data isn't transactional. Data is forever. One data, one specific data about you and your purchase history and your, and, and your life and whatever is out there there's no taking it back. It doesn't matter if they gave you $1.25 million instead of $125. The, the monetary kind of transactional nature of that, I think it gets people to look at data. I mean, it's insidious. It gets people to look at data in the wrong kind of uh, way. So, so from, like, from your perspective then, would it make more sense, obviously this is impossible, but if they were to say something along the lines of, from now on, we're going to pay you 125 bucks a month, for example. Uh, would that be more fair, or would that still be kind of monetizing the data? I mean, I think it's the best that one might get in the current situation. Oh, I don't sure. think it's more fair at all, because I think the problem is looking at that data as transactional, as worth a specific monetary amount, like a one-time or even an ongoing payment in the first place, because the more analytical power you can bring to bear on a set of data, the more and valuable more you it get gets. It. You, yeah. The more valuable it gets, and the more you can wring out of it. It's not, in a sense, it's not a, sta a stagnant re and kind of static resource. It, and, more, and this is something I think that like the average person doesn't appreciate as much as yeah. they should. Like programmers, I think will will have the understanding of the power that you can get when you double or triple or magnify by 100 times the amount of computing power and other data that you have access to in reference to that yeah. one piece of data. And we can get that, but it, it's hard to kind of get that across to someone who's just seeing this as a, oh, you know, they lost all their data points. Oh, well. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest problems we have right now kind of as kind of evangelists or kind of reporters in the tech sector is communicating to people the, the huge power that data has. Because people understand it on a particularly, like, people will understand certain aspects of it. Like, when you tell the story of the Walmart sending the, the um, crib ads and stuff in the mail to the house because they data mined and realized that the teenager daughter was, was pregnant. pregnant. You know, people can understand those very kind of, one-to-one -one relationships of data mining, but I think it takes a certain understanding of computation and second-order effects that a lot of people, again, they just don't have the expertise in this area. And when we, um, when a company like um, Equifax is able to co-opt that narrative and make data and the loss of data 
a very transactional kind of solution to that. It further cements in people's minds the idea that, oh, they lost it and it's kind of gone away and that's too bad. Yeah. And they forget that in 10 years this data might come back to haunt them. And another kind of point that I'm kind of realizing now is that uh, I, I usually think of proprietary software companies generally as just the feedstuff of Microsoft, and that there's a lot of companies that over the years, Microsoft specifically, has bought out. And you can kind of trace the history of a lot of different products as, oh, hey, this was a cool product, and then Microsoft bought it. And now it's a Microsoft thing. And it's not, of course, yeah. just Microsoft, right? I mean, Apple does this, no. Google does this, Facebook does yeah, this. Yeah. All the big ones do. But especially the three you mentioned, Facebook, Apple, Google, like in reference to these giant stores of data, they haven't bought Equifax yet. But it is certainly plausible that within the next 20 years, some of these large data store companies are going to get gobbled up. Now, maybe it won't be Equifax, but it could very right. well be the, the kind of scale, like you were kind of talking about earlier, that the old legacy data brokers are kind of pulling together. They're going to be a very juicy target for a company like Facebook that is scaling to the billions of users. You know, I wonder... Yeah, I, I wonder about that, though. I think already, and, you know, the fourth one, I think we should add to this conversation, of course, is Amazon. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's the most direct corollary to something like Equifax because it's so admired in retail. Yeah. I think already these companies have much faster data stores. I think they look at somebody like Equifax, and I don't have hard data points to prove this, I think they look at somebody like Equifax and they laugh, they laugh and they say, oh, Look at you running your little <laughs> lemonade stand at the end of the block. Isn't that cute? Yeah. Here's yeah. Here's twenty five cents for the cup. Thanks, buddy. Like yeah. I know Facebook does publish a yearly report with how many, or, or at least bi yearly or whatever, with like how many data points they have. <laughs> it's, it's like a ridiculous number, of course. I I, I wouldn't even yeah. begin to guess it. Uh, Prediction Book does occasionally have a claim or two for it, basically saying Facebook's going to have so many data points this year. So it, th these numbers are probably out there for the interested listener to go out and find. So if, if you yeah. do, people out there listening, <laughs> if you have some free time, see if you can find the number for Facebook in their yearly report and find something about Equifax and see how they compare. See, see if we're kind of on the right track here because that, that seems yeah. a kind of testable claim. So. Well, and I think the other thing, too, is that, like, people look at direct data as problematic, and they forget that metadata can almost in some ways tell you more. Yeah. Because they're looking at the network effects, not the individual effects. And you look at this, this is one of the problems that people, or that you have with encryption systems. You can have end-to-end -end encryption, but if you can still get metadata on where those packets were sent, at what time, what the size of them they were. Like, unless you have a system, like, I mean, you have, you know, systems for like Bitcoin where they have the, the laundering services where all the coins are mixed and then right. sent back out. We don't seem to have that for other forms of it, or at least not that I'm aware of. I shouldn't say we don't have, but they don't seem to be at least public prevalent yet for other forms. Like I, I think that that's the sort of thing like data. there has been research at the kind of like master's level computer science research. The basic research has been being done on those problems over the past 10 years, but like yeah. you say, that hasn't hit the public yet. And the public, right. A, doesn't appreciate the problem, and B, if, even if they did, they wouldn't know where to go at this point. Right. Like, I just, I wonder if also then, look, like, framing, when you frame something like a loss of kind of data autonomy, I wonder if instead of thinking it as, like, let's say, pocket litter, or like, you know, something fell off of your purse or your wallet, or you lost your wallet, mm -hmm. maybe a better way, and this um, might be contentious, you know, but might be to look at it as like an amputation. Okay. And I don't want to get into, like the politics of the body and the disability and representation, all that kind of shit. But it's like it's something that unless we get the Luke Skywalker hands, you know, now I'm really going down the rabbit hole of the metaphor here, <laughs> but like it's something that once it's gone, at least right now, stick with the metaphor, it can get come back and it has ways of inhibiting you that you aren't necessarily gonna be aware of at first. Right. Like, like so your you like know, sense um, of balance your kind of yeah. ability to yeah. scratch an itch because your brain your brain yeah. still generates the feeling of an itch occasionally. Yeah, yeah. Stuff you like lose that. your eyes and you don't realize that like okay, well to get to this thing over here, there's actually no path. You just got to be able to walk thirty feet 
feet this way and then another 100 feet that way. Like, yeah, whether it's, whether it's a limb, whether it's a, a sensory thing, like it, you lose something that, that is fundamental to kind of what and, and who you are. And this is what I worry about with Jake. It is like the, way, the, the idea that people, and, and it's also being conditioned in the way that we trade data for services. I mean, I think one of this is one of the fundamental problems with the way the internet ecology kind of grew up is that you have a system that was based on an academic backbone mm. where there were really commercial enterprises. It wasn't built for that. And because it wasn't built for that, we had to come up with other ways of funding anything that was grafted onto it that was going to be commercial. And that was either through exchanging data for services or ex- exchanging attention, which is another form of data, and ad kind of watching for services. Right. Because we ne- we never built at the at the kind of kind of system architecture level, we never built in frameworks for let's say microtransactions. Right. Um, like I would love to just pay two bucks a month for Gmail. Because right. as much as I am trepidatious about Google, I find their system extremely useful. I find their search algorithms really useful. I have every email help that's been sent to me since 2008, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's be, you know, a bit of a pack rat and a hoarder. Right. It's not so good. But, I mean, I find it to be extremely convenient and extremely useful. And, you know, when you're talking about the way that kind of technologies get bought, let's say Microsoft or Google, they get bought and they become kind of crappy because maybe it'll, it's not in their business plan to make it better or they're going in a different direction. Or, or they're just like they just so don't big. Have the attention the that, time. Yeah, the, the, the bureaucracy itself starts to yeah. eat up their own or they're, or they're just apple hires. We don't even care about your service. You've, you've, you've collected 30 engineers in this problem domain and we would like this. We recognize that you have excellent talent and we want you to work on this. <laughs> so we'll buy you and shut your product down. Yeah. And how many times has this happened to all of us? There's an excellent service, whether it's freeware, whether it's open source even sometimes, whether it's a server-side thing, whether it's an application, and it gets bought, and because you weren't paying for it, it goes away. Right. And I, I'm, I'm tired of that happening. I find myself using less and less new services just out of the kind of time expediency of, like, I'm not going to sink my time and effort and organization into a tool that I can't necessarily rely upon. So, so and just, we, we are starting to kind of hit our a little bit of a time limit here. So for the bend, okay. uh, kind of a quick yeah. last question. Is yeah. there any way for people to like subscribe financially to you? or like a, Not as of now. Not um, as of now? I'm just getting, like I'll be launching this week. When I would, once I've got some back content, absolutely. I want to have it as a... And whether I use a service like Patreon, but something on that model, yeah. where there will be X number of articles per week, there might be secondary content that is for is subscriber only. This seems to be a model that is working for a lot of tech bloggers. Mm-hmm. Um, where you have you know most of your content open, but you have secondary or extra material that people can they get. I mean, of course, people aren't often you know subscribing for that reason. They're subscribing again to make sure the service is still available. It's still there, yeah. So, um, but it's an extra benefit. It's like, okay, well, you know, thanks if you get this on top of it. So, this so is a podcast I, or I, I will point out the, the, at this point that there is a subscriber star for this podcast slash <laughs> my work. And if people yeah. are interested in making this a more permanent thing, because it is currently off the side of my table right now, I am totally cool with that. Uh, and with that, any last things you want to kind of mention? Before we cut out, five billion dollars was a ridiculously pathetic fine for Facebook. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Good closing no, words there. <laughs> but uh, no, thank you very much. This has been a very interesting conversation, and uh, yeah. Hopefully the beginning of many more, I'm sure. So I am yeah, going exactly. to end this show. I have a Maria Pansery. Uh, I've already played one of her songs. I hope it's not the same song, but I think this one is untitled. But I've been listening to it this week, so hopefully you all enjoy. And thank you for listening, and tune in next week. I, again, don't know what time. Uh, my schedule is so up in the air right now. It's It's going to be roughly around the kind of 6.45 p.m. Saskatchewan time time, but we'll see what happens and who kind of shows up. So thanks again for listening, and we will see you next week. As soon as I find my cable, where did my cable go?
I just wanna hear you calling